just starting to rain outside my Hello, room. my name is Joe Aten Shemko, and uh, I'm a library coordinator for the Special Collections uh, at the Blue Library. Welcome to our hands-on history series, which usually takes place every month on the second Saturday of the month at 2 p.m. Uh, today, our program is hands off, not only because it's virtual, but also because you can't touch the theremin. Uh, first, a few housekeeping rules. Uh, please write in your questions in the, in the ask a question box below, and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. Uh, also, if you're curious in enlarging your screen, just ho hover over the top right arrow pointing downward and that basically will minimize the chat screen. So only do that if you want to. Um, as you'll soon see, the history of Leo Thurman, the creator of the Thurman instrument, uh, his history is as interesting as the instrument itself. Uh, the pre presentation will be divided into three parts. We'll have uh, the uh, first part will be Gary's presentation, his slide presentation of the Thurman. Uh, then Gary will try and I emphasize the word try. <laughs> He'll uh, try playing the instrument. And finally, we will take questions at the end. But first, a little bit about Dr. Gary Galvin. He curates the music special collections at the Free Library of Philadelphia, including the Edwin A. Fleischer Collection of Orchestral Music, which is the largest lending library of orchestral performance materials in the world. The Fleischer Collection loans, scores, and parts to orchestras of all sizes all over the globe for concerts and recordings. Today happens to be the 143rd anniversary of Edwin Fleischer's birth, so who knew? Gary himself is a, a Latin American classical and jazz guitarist. He trained at Rowan University, the University of Central Florida, and the University of Florida. He has taught Pan American music history at Temple and LaSalle universities and regularly uh, for a wide variety of public, and he writes regularly for uh, lots of publishers. He is an editor for the only English language biographical dictionary of Latin American composers. So here's Gary. Hi, thanks for taking the time to join us for this great adventure. Well, I don't see any ghosts. I did find this Newsweek from 1986, Why America Loves Saddam Hussein. That's it. It's one thing for a ghost to terrorize my children, but quite another for him to play my theremin. <laughs> It's one thing for a ghost to terrorize my children, but quite another to play my theremin. With those lines, Homer Simpson places the part of the theremin in pop culture solidly. Um, right behind Artie Ziff here in the background is a drawing of a theremin. And to give you an idea, I am a professional music geek, and I can tell you that is a left-handed theremin. I just hang my head in shame, I guess. Uh, more on that later. At a time of social distancing, what could be more appropriate than an instrument played without touching it? This is a picture of Alexander Stepanov, Leon Theremin's first theremin student in the United States, playing, but not touching, a theremin. Stepanov was a Russian-born concert singer who played the instrument for an NBC radio broadcast that was advertised with this photo. The theremin is one of the earliest electronic instruments and became the first commercially produced electronic instrument. The theremin essentially launched the electronic music revolution of the 20th century. Invented in 1920 in the Soviet Union, its creator would obtain patents for the instrument first in Europe and then in the United States in 1928. All those patents would send money back to the Soviet Union, not to the inventor. 
RCA Victor began manufacturing theremins in Camden, New Jersey in 1929. This sketch shows the expanse of Camden RCA Victory fact, uh, I'm sorry, Camden RCA Victor factory as it was planned. Built in 1909, many of the buildings were ultimately torn down in the 1990s. The iconic central building serves as condominiums now and features a uh, tower with stained glass windows depicting Nippard, the company's mascot. Uh, these were installed in 1915 and repaired in the 1990s. The instrument created quite a wave of publicity. One can find many old newspaper articles in our library's online databases. These represent just a few pieces from the Philadelphia Inquirer in the late 1920s. And it gives us a clue about the sensation that inspired RCA Victor to manufacture the theremin. Ultimately, it is a quirky instrument with a very peculiar sound and it's surprisingly difficult to play well. So it remained a relative novelty with the general public and RCA Victor only manufactured 500 theremins in total. The last document itself from that pilot production was in 1931. To give you some perspective, RCA Victor would manufacture 9,000 radios per day by 1932. Today, only about 132 of those original theremins have survived. As Aitan had said, even stranger than the sound of the theremin is the story of its inventor, the Russian scientist, engineer, and inventor Leon Theremin. Born in St. Petersburg, he would start experimenting with electricity and optics in school as a teenager. And by 17, he built an impressive home laboratory complete with a million volt Tesla co uh, coil. I'm sure his parents were thrilled. He completed military engineering school, earned a radio engineer diploma and oversaw the construction of a radio station in Saratov to link Moscow to the Volga section of Russia in the 1910s. This is really like a decade before radio becomes a thing in the United States. During the Russian Civil War in 1919, the anti-communist White Army advanced on the station and Thurman and his crew dismantled the base quickly, sent equipment east to safety and blew up the 390 foot broadcast tower. He then set up an international listening station and began training radio specialists. By 1920, he was working with Abram Eoff in Petrograd. Pet, bleh, Petrograd. Petrograd is the post-revolutionary Soviet name for St. Petersburg, the city where he was born. Uh, and he was teaching at what is now known as the Eoff Institute. There he invented the first functioning television and was working on proximity sensors, think motion detectors. When he added a circuit to the motion detector to generate a tone, he accidentally discovered that he could manipulate sound by moving his hand near the magnetic coils. And he demonstrated the find to Professor Eoff and a group of fellow students by playing the classical melody he recalled from piano lessons. Any music geeks out there will appreciate that it was Sanson's piece, The Swan, that he played for them. He toured Europe in the 1920s uh, seeking those patents uh, for the device and ultimately settled in the United States in the 1920s. In the United States, Thurman met Philadelphia-born Lavinia Williams in the mid-1930s while working on a dance project. Williams herself was part of what was called the American Negro Ballet Company that operated from 1934 to 1938. They were really more of a jazz modern dance troupe than classic ballet, but they were, nevertheless, the first black dance troupe in the United States. The falsely named first Negro classic ballet company formed in 1946, a decade later, and the famed New York Negro Ballet established in 1954 would follow at some distance. Lavinia had trained in art and dance and spoke six languages, including Russian. Theremin built an amplification system for the troupe. Uh, he also experimented with modern dance projects with them in which they would dance near a theremin with a platform um, and 
the sounds produced would be made by the dance moves. One of the dancers recalled how even the movement of a finger would change the pitch and the routine was extremely difficult. During this time, Theremin totally fell for Williams and the two were married in early 1938. The marriage of a Soviet scientist inventor and a black dancer created quite a scandal at the time and he took great delight in introducing his wife at big social events where he might ruffle feathers. He lost a number of friends because of this marriage, but evidently they weren't true friends. In late 1938, Thurman was whisked away by Soviet secret police. Lavinia and their friends thought he had been kidnapped, but scholars are suggesting it might be possible that he was running from bad debts and tax problems. Whatever the cause, he found himself locked up in Butyrka prison in Moscow and later the Kolyma gold mines in Siberia, where he worked in a Sharashka, or a secret lab in the Gulag camp system. There he was reformed by working on top secret electronics projects for the government and received the Stalin Award in 1947. Mostly he worked on spy equipment like little listening devices or what we call bugs. Thurman would eventually teach at the Moscow Conservatory in the late, and in the late 1980s and early 1990s, re-embarked on a tour of Europe and the US touting his legacy. In 1945, a Soviet children's group, the Young Pioneers, if you think like the Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, um, they presented a wooden carving of the Great Seal of the United States to the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. The gift hung in the ambassador's private study for seven years before a radio operator at the British Embassy picked up American conversations on open radio when the Soviets were beaming radio waves at that embassy. It took the U.S. nearly a year to find the device in the sweep of the office. The thing, as it uh, was called, had been invented by Theremin himself and was embedded in the Great Seal. With no power source, no cords, no batteries to change, it operated kind of like the RFID chips do in our credit cards today. So it gives you an idea of how far ahead of its time Theremin was in his thinking. Clara Rockmore became the Theremin virtuoso. She toured the United States playing classical repertoire, usually duets with piano, in which she would substitute the Theremin for the flute or violin parts in the piece. Three tours in the 1940s paired her with Philadelphia's own all-star, Paul Robeson. Some of our Philadelphia fans may know the Paul Robeson House and Museum at 4951 Walnut or Paul Robeson High School at 4125 Ludlow Street in West Philadelphia. Although Rockmore and Robeson would perform separate sets on stage, they became very close friends on the tour. Robeson, a, an incredibly talented bass baritone, distinguished himself not only as a college athlete at Rutgers and Columbia, but also as a stage and screen actor and a political activist, which would develop quite a number of problems for him late in life with the US government. He studied a number of languages, including African dialects, and he spoke Russian fluently. And he and Rockmore would frequently be found deep in conversation in Russian, affectionately calling each other Pavlik and Klaroshka. Uh, this is a great example of the serious classical repertoire uh, that was developed for the Theremin. Uh, Anis Fulehan, a Cy Cypress-born composer, wrote a fantasy for Theremin and orchestra. This is one of three concertos for Theremin and orchestra that we have in the Fleischer collection and have available to orchestras all over the globe for performance. Composed in 1944 specifically for Clara Rockmore, this piece premiered with the New York City Symphony under Leopold Stokowski with Clara herself at the theremin. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
By the mid-1940s, the strange sound of the theremin became, also became part of Hollywood's go-to sounds for mystery and science fiction. Alfred Hitchcock's film Spellbound and Billy Wilder's movie Lost Weekend both employed the theremin as part of their soundtracks, and the instrument became a staple of B sci-fi movies such as The Day the Earth Stood Still. In 1996, Tim Burton's comic sci-fi film Mars Attacks employed the now cliche sci-fi use of theremin as well. Robert Moog experimented making theremins with solid state circuitry as a teen and would introduce the Moog synthesizer in 1964 to change popular music forever. Consider nowadays much popular music is generated with keyboards and with drum machines and other electronic music devices and it's Moog's, Moog's synthesizer that really was the gateway to this for popular music. Uh, a modified theremin makes an appearance in the Beach Boys tune Good Vibrations in 1966. Oops, here we go. I love the perfect things you get And the way the sunlight plays upon your feet I hear the sound of the good to me And the wind that moves to keep you feeling I'm taking up Great tune. We saw a great example of Thurman's use in visual pop culture at the beginning of all of this, and some of you may be a little more familiar with its um, actually multiple appearances on the Big Bang Theory more recently. Howard, did you solve the install time problem yet? No, it's a little tricky. I'm going to try having it pick up the light. <laughs> What 
can do it playing the theremin. No, I mean, what are you doing with a theremin? Playing it. I've loved the theremin from the first moment I heard the original Star Trek theme, and it's been killing me that it just sits in my closet gathering dust. That was, of course, Jim Parsons playing theoretical physicist Dr. Sheldon Cooper, who was playing his theremin in this clip. Not only does he play rather poorly, but Sheldon is wrong. The Star Trek original series theme by Alexander Courage would use singer Luli Jean Norman with a flute and organ in a mix to make it sound not unlike a theremin. And that's the first version of it. They later started using an electric violin in place of that. And then ultimately for reruns, Ellen Carlson performed. So Bazinga. And that wraps the history portion of what we're doing. There we go. Uh, I have with me today um, the an actual theremin. Uh, this is a Moog theremin uh, developed by Robert Moog's company. Uh, the Fleischer Collection purchased this uh, this past year uh, because we have three concertos for theremin and orchestra, and it seemed wise to have something on site in case somebody wanted to practice for it. Uh, we also have an absolutely brilliant music lending in musical instrument lending program uh no wind instruments mind you uh but string instruments guitars violins uh, mandolins uh different variations of drums and we'd like to have this reside over in the music department so the library can ultimately be able to come in and be able to plug in a headphone and experiment with this instrument there's a number of uh, little pieces on the front of this. There's a, an output here, which just goes straight out like an output from a guitar. You can't vary the sound from this. There is an output to headphones. I have the headphone output going to an amplifier right now, and I can actually determine the volume from this, and I can keep the volume down. Uh, th that's for the headphones. There is a second volume knob. Uh, I'm still experimenting with this and discovering what this is all about. There is a tuning, um, a pitch knob where you actually tune the theremin. Now, the weird thing about this instrument is um, not, a, a, it, it's, here's the weird thing. If you play a piano, you hit a particular key, there's a string length within it, and when you hammer that string, it plays that pitch. You don't have to really do much about that. You have your instrument tuned every now and again. If you have something like a cello, the string open plays a particular pitch. And you know no matter where you stand, no matter how you position it, it's going to play that pitch. And as you move your hand up and down the, uh, the fretboard or the fingerboard, you can change the pitch on it. Now, the thing with the theremin, I establish a pitch but then depending on where my body is, and I'll demonstrate this in a moment, it can change the bass pitch, which really makes it difficult. There are two other knobs on it which uh, involve waveform, and the waveform is whether it has a harsher sound or a more subtle sound, and then brightness, which actually is the tone, whether it's a deeper tone or a brighter tone. I am going to now turn this up and give you an idea. There are two, two devices here. There are two electromagnetic coils and they determine the pitch and the volume. The piece over here that I actually am touching controls volume and only volume from inaudibility to its maximum volume. So you heard in the Theremin Concerto Clara actually did, 
she did short little staccato passages. The other electromagnetic coil antenna here is, is pitch and only pitch from complete deepest tone. I'm going to stand back here to its highest tone. The challenge is most players will try to secure themselves in a very stable position. Uh, if you're playing the third thing, you're probably not stable in the first place, but that's a whole other issue. If I let go and I let the volume go up, however I lean will actually affect the pitch. So if my body wavers, I'm going to change the pitch. That can be challenging. Now I can tune it here. This kind of this sets the variation of how I can control the sound. There are some online tutorials that are great. Uh, I've driven administration at the library crazy when we first got this in the Fleischer collection. I played it, and they could hear it down the hall. We're coming out of their offices, wondering if we'd been invaded by aliens or or what was going on. And some of the online tutorials will show you that you start with the hand position and try to set the tuning. Of course, any movement I make here is challenging me so that you can get an octave. And then one of the greatest challenges is learning how to play a scale. quit now that is the best scale I have played since we have had this instrument uh, it's an incredibly challenging instrument to, to master for sure um, and it's a quirky thing um, the one thing I was I told you that I'd come back about I can't believe I played that scale I'm glad we it. It. I can prove it um, the left-handed theremin essentially had these two elements switched where you would control your volume with your right hand and your pitch with your left hand. And that was the only difference. Uh, there actually was a left-handed theremin created. Um, there's a gentleman who played it on stage at Carnegie Hall with a whole group of other theremin players. Uh, but that's a, a good kind of throw into what the theremin is all about. And uh, I get to keep my hands off the instrument for the, the most part. Uh, when I demonstrate it in the library, it's always fun if I let somebody play it. Because when, when, you, when you're done experimenting with this really odd thing, your tendency is, okay, now I'm going to go away. And again, if you go away, it gets louder and cries like a needy baby for you and gets administrators to come out from down the hall and wonder what the heck is going on. All right. Good job, Gary. So we are now going to field some questions. And I warn our um, audience that if we don't get any questions, I'm going to throw some questions out at Gary. Uh, and I will do that. So we are going to start with a question by Matt Friedman. Uh, and he says the electro theremin used by the Beach Boys wasn't actually a theremin. This is true. Um, it's somewhere in between a theremin and a non martina. What they did was they put a touch strip on the top of the box that they had. Um, one of the challenges here, as I mentioned, like if you have a cello and I, you know, you play that open string, it's the open string. Here, I have to gauge where my body is. So when you're starting, it becomes challenging. If you have it tuned and you have a touch strip, as I move, I can move, I can actually mark on the top of the device, and they did this, where it's going to play. It's essentially the same principle, but the way that it's, it's played is what's different. And that's an excellent point that you notice that it is a different device. Um, they use the touch strip in order to make it easier to play. Okay, full disclosure, I went to school with Matt Friedman over 30 years ago. So. <laughs> um, okay, so right? I think, uh, what'd you say? You were in kindergarten then. 
Yes, exactly. Yes. Uh, Sean Stoops uh, gave you kudos on your playing. Thank you, Sean. So, um, do you do a bar? Do you do bar mitzvahs by any chance with the uh, okay. bar mitzvahs, brises? You have to be right. very gentle with playing it at the bris because you can yes. have a horrible mistake. Right. We don't want that. Um, okay. So, can someone come to the free library and actually play that theremin you have that you just played? Can someone do that? Yeah, um, we're going to be working with music. Of course, we're in the midst of this COVID epidemic at the moment and having um, having a shutdown. Uh, but what we're looking to do is when we begin to return to a more normal kind of a function is we want to have this reside over in the music department near the electronic keyboards. They have keyboards there where you can come in and you can play, you put on headphones. You'll be able to come in, put on a pair of headphones and experiment with, with the theremin. Um, we think it's a great educational tool. It's it's a great way to, to become exposed to music. Uh, music right. is really just one of the wonderful things in the world. And the more of it we give to all of you, the better off we all are. Right. We should I should say to elucidate about the music lending program that uh, we are one of the few libraries. Uh, and I really don't know how many libraries are doing this, but you can check out an instrument. So just like you can check out a book, you can come in and check out a violin, uh, a guitar, and the list goes on. So it's been uh, anything that fit on a septa bus. <laughs> that's actually a parameter. Is they wanted to get right. the that you could carry onto a septa or any of the public transportation and be able to take home. Right. Uh, but even uh, having said that, you won't be able to check out a theremin. But what you're saying is you will at least, when that time comes, it's not set up yet, that someone when someone will be able to come and play the theremin with a headset on, so, right. All right, we do have some more questions. Uh, let's see, um, I have here one in the chat and one ask a question. Here's one by Christy Wolf. Uh, the theremins in your photos were larger than the one you demonstrated, uh, the one you were playing. Is that because the machine was larger uh, or is it uh, because of the case that it's placed in? You're you're absolutely right. It had to do with the electronics at the time. I have behind me. This is from here down is a 1920s radio, um, and the way that electronics ran at the time is you had tube technology in them. So you would have these tubes that were yay big. So the cabinet had to be big enough to house those tubes in electronics. Now, with the 1950s, we began moving pretty regularly into solid state, and you would have little chips and devices that would um, conduct the electronics. So it was a matter of being able to put something that used to be this big into technology that was this big, and you move from essentially from this size to this size. Got it. Which kind of ties into Jennifer Butler's question, can you explain the electronics the electronic aspect of how it works. I wish I could. I am not an I'm a music historian, not an electronic specialist. It's it's a wonderful question, and mm -hmm. we'll have some resources over here for you to go through to read a little bit more about the electronics. Electronics was one of my most challenging topics in in high school or in in college even. Uh, essentially, Thurman had been working with uh, devices for for motion detectors. And he had radio um, radio signals going and electromagnetic coils, and it was essentially just by manipulating the electromagnetic coil. And and I'm sorry, but I know that's that's about the limit of my knowledge with electronics. Uh, he just he recognized that electromagnetic signals, anything that can that could conduct something, would affect it. Uh, we actually learned. When we first brought in the um, the theremin into the the Fleischer collection, I set it up. We had some fun with the sounds. We were getting used to it, and then I went to move some items, and then I set it down next to one of the computers, and all of a sudden I couldn't get any sound out of it. And I called Sweetwater, from whom we ordered it, and asked them. Went through, and he he went through and asked me some certain questions. Well, where is it sitting? Oh, well. You know, it's sitting by our computer, you guys move it away from the computer. <laughs> okay, oh, hey, it works great now. 
Um, and so really anything that, that impacts the, the electromagnetic field, anything that can conduct electricity will impact that sound. Okay. Uh, but Jennifer, you ask a wonderful question that is way beyond the scope of my expertise. All right, let's take a look at this question. I think that's informative. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, all right, you know, um, it's interesting how we, I mean, you're the one who, uh, Gary, who suggested we do this topic. And I thought, whoa, what a great idea. Let's talk about the theremin, something entertaining that's not political, that's sheer. <laughs> Yeah, and here we are, the history of the Thurman and Leon yeah, Thurman and political, yes, politics. You know, Paul you know, Robeson and his, yeah. uh, his communism. Paul Robeson's got a wonderful life and Thurman getting, you know, just becoming this this essentially a spy for the Soviet Union. Yeah, we get into oh. politics to some extent. So I'm going to, let's see, this doesn't work. Um, I'm going to put a list of links um, for all of you to inform yourselves things at the free library that you can check out or maybe just titles on the theremin um, trying to put it up now there are um, a number of really good resources uh, the library one of the things that the library has uh, this video is it's Theremin and Odyssey. This was uh, the video that really got me turned on to a lot of the history of the instrument. It's a it's a beautiful documentary. Uh, Robert Moog is interviewed in it. Clara Rockmore is in it. And even Leon Theremin himself is featured in it, as well as some of the dancers that were friends of Lavinia and the likes. Uh, this is available at the free library uh, to view. Uh, we also have, there you go, it's the top, uh, so those are the books. Yeah. And I'm going to include the videos. Include there. Uh, definitely entertaining, worth the time to look at, whether you're a music fan or not. It's uh, it's certainly just an interesting piece of history. Uh, quite entertaining, for sure. Uh, there's, there's so much to explore on this. If you go online and look at some of the resources, uh, we included Moog, uh, Moog Music that manufactures this amongst other uh, versions of this. You can buy one for anywhere from $350 to $650 there. I mean, that's expensive, but that's not, you know, a, a $20,000 cello or something like that. Right, exactly. Okay, so I included the links on the chat features. Everyone who's uh, listening to this presentation, you can always refer to the book titles and you can click on the links even after this presentation is over. So that the presentation will be for you to replay anytime you want to. We have a couple of more questions. Let's take a look. Do you know about more recent dance and theremin collaborations like the ballet companies that you mentioned? I'm not, um... I'm not familiar with what is going on. You can actually go online. There's a few players out there. Um, there's a player in England that had contacted us a number of years ago trying to get a performance. Uh, there's, um, there's several players online who will have their, um, their sites up. There's a few online tutorials on how to play the theremin. Uh, I'm not aware of all of the things that are going on with that. Um, Trying to think of the the one uh, Carolyn Ike E Y C K mm -hmm. uh, Carolina Ike is one of the people who performs on this regularly and she has several tutorial videos on uh, but she's one of the people that's doing a lot with performing uh, it, again it's such a quirky instrument that, sure. that there are a few people out there that are good enough that they are playing professionally and Carolina right. is one of those people. Jennifer Butler says that there was a Thurman performer at the Rotunda last year. Oh, so, very cool. All right. So thank you so much, Gary. Uh, look forward to future uh, virtual hands-on, hands-off histories. Uh, and, uh, oh, Gretchen Shoten. I'm sure I mispronounced your last name. Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. Those are great. The, great organization. 
Yeah, had a woman playing the theremin for a virtual webinar they did. Oh, I did not know that. Um, everybody, thank you for making the time to come, you know, yes. to, come, to come to your computer today. Right. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Gary. I think that was a great presentation. Uh, and those comments keep coming. The Divine Hand Orchestra. And if you want to do uh, my brother out in Indiana, he was saying, oh, yeah, Low Far in the Hand People was like a band mm -hmm. back in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, great stuff. There's uh, Take the time, enjoy, explore. There's so much fun stuff to find out there uh, to entertain. Right. And um, I do. The last thing I'm going to say is I know when I was promoting this program, that the way I did that, I was I was talking about uh, I was talking about Star Trek and the theremin sound in Star Trek, and only to find out later on that that wasn't a theremin. So I am a right. Right. Yes. <laughs> on that note, Gary, thank you for doing this. Thank you all for coming. And stay safe, and I'll uh, see you later. Thank you.